All right. How many of you are going to do that? You're going to exchange for a crown. Yeah, amen, amen, amen. Thanks, guys. Um, how many of you are familiar with a group called the Gideons? Okay, good, good, quite a few. That's, that's good. So uh, when Eric comes up here, he won't be coming up speaking to an audience of uh, <laughs> misfits. Um, there you, is this light, is that always that bright? Is it, have I not been on stage for that long? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I will not miss my preaching opportunity next time. So today we have the Gideons with us here. Uh, Era Sobek, yes, amen. Uh, I chatted with him on the phone the other day. I've been talking with Donnie, uh, one of his cohorts here as well. And I, I noticed another gentleman here, Scott. All right, so they, they come in threes. Just know that uh, anytime you're talking to the Gideons. And uh, I, we've had some, we had some great conversations. There's a hotel over in uh, Superior. Superior, Montana, where the first Gideon Bible was placed. Now, I, I hope I'm not stealing any of your thunder here. Um, so they've come today to just give us a little background on who they are, what they're doing. And I suspect, noticing uh, Era's uh, title here, Director, Gideon Education and Training, that if you want to be a Gideon, he's going to be the man. So, Era, come on up. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Up from Nashville, Tennessee, so I really appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you a little bit about what God's doing uh, through, uh, really, those individuals that say yes to him, and really that light is very bright. Up here, I, I appreciate that. But up, we had a state convention here in Spokane, and so uh, they gave me an opportunity to come up and share. So thanks again. I, at that convention, I met a man by the name of James, and you might know somebody like James. You probably don't know James himself, but he does live down in the Spokane Valley. Uh, there's probably a lot of people like James who, uh, growing up, uh, he had a pretty tough childhood. Mom and dad weren't around. A whole lot. And he's a fighter. And uh, he fought with his siblings. His sister's a fighter, too. And uh, that wasn't a good combination. And uh, he says, uh, he was telling us he can remember having claw marks on his arms from them fighting and having to lock himself in a bathroom because she was chasing him with a knife and having death threats from her boyfriend. It really was not a good situation. He wanted something different. He went on a camping trip with a buddy of his. And uh, on that camping trip, his, his friend told him, look, you know, God can give you two things through Jesus. He can give you a new life. And he can give you assurance of salvation, of spending eternity in heaven. That was pretty appealing uh, to James and he went home, and he remembered that his brother, who was in the military, had got a little pocket-sized New Testaments. Maybe some of you guys have seen some of these uh, from time to time. He had gotten one, and he had left it at home. Shame on him, but worked out good for James. James began to read uh, this little New Testament. And as he began to read it, he got to... Uh, I got too many things in my hands here, I'm sorry. He got to read in the back where it... Uh, it summarizes some verses in the back. And he read John 3.16. You all know John 3.16? Yeah. yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That sounded pretty good to James. He wanted a new life. He kept on reading, and it says that all are sinners, and he, and he read, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and he knew he had fallen short. He had, he had already succumbed to this coping mechanism of dealing with the family situation using drugs and alcohol. He kept reading, and he read Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. 
eternal. He wanted a new life, and he began to cry out to God. He had been in church just enough to know that he had something wrong with him, and he knew just enough to know that there was a God. And he said, will you do what you said you would do? Will you do what you said you would do? And that day, James became a new creature in Christ. And we give God the praise and the glory for that. James married a fine lady, and they had four kids. Three of them are in full-time ministry today uh, across the country. And we just, uh, we just praise God for what he does. And honestly, it's just amazing what God will do when folks take the Great Commission seriously. When we just say yes to what God asks us to do. Um, the Great Commission. You know what the Great Commission is? Yeah. Great Commission. I, I pulled it up here. I'm going to read it. Is that okay? I didn't always know what the Great Commission was. It's, uh, you can find it in Matthew 28, uh, uh, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I didn't always know that they called that the Great Commission. I grew up in church, and I didn't know what that was. And somebody said... You know, they call it the Great Commission. They don't call it the Great Suggestion. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, I bet you're right. I bet you're right. They don't call it a Great Suggestion for a reason. And uh, the Gideons International, actually, you know, the best uh, research says that only uh, 5% of those who profess to be born-again believers ever share their faith with a non-believer. Five percent. Those aren't really high numbers, are they? No. Nah, so the Gideons International actually steps <clears throat> into a place where we uh, continue to be a ministry to and for Christian business and professional men and their wives. We... we, we uh, we are committed to strengthen their Christian testimony, their Christian testimony for Christ in your community. And we do that by organizing. That's what organizations do. Right? They organize Christian business, professional men and their wives, and we equip each other on, on ways to share the gospel, like even just having it available with you, and uh, mobilizing them into your communities, whether we're talking to a hotel manager at a hotel nearby or talking to the school administrators in the schools and offering copies of the Word of God to kids in schools. You know, James got that copy of, of Scripture because somebody, somebody took the Great Commission seriously. Some church like yours was generous enough to purchase Scriptures to be placed, to be given to a military personnel who he didn't take it seriously, but somebody did. And it's amazing what God will do. You know, God is still God. He, he is who he says he is. He's not who they say he is. He is who he says he is. He's still in the business of redeeming his children, isn't he? But the world is a little bit crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it's a little crazy. You know, we've got, uh, uh, we got some uh, letters in from the Ukraine recently. You know, we've got about 2,000 members over in the Ukraine. We've got about 3,000 members in Russia. I got a chance this summer to talk with a few of them. You know, uh, God is, first of all, God is protecting his people. He really is. And we thank him for that. And, um, uh, they're not the only ones doing this, but the, the Gideons and Auxiliary over there in the Ukraine are really reaching out to their neighbors, and they're reaching out to their relatives, and they're even reaching out to their strangers and offering a, a message of hope, not just in the Word of God, but also in physical needs. In fact, um, I can't give a lot of names because it's kind of sensitive over there. They really don't want to be identified. There's a bit of... Uh, 
You know, when your country is in war, you get really sensitive about where your name gets posted, you know? So I don't have a lot of names, but one Gideon comes in, and he, he actually reported, wrote in, and he's got 22 people in his house. 22 people. Have you ever been in a European home? They are not big. They are not big. 22 people in his home. And you know, they have the Gideons come over every night for a prayer meeting. And he invites these 22 people to participate in that prayer meeting as they pray for their country and they pray for peace and they pray for the salvation of the souls of the people in Ukraine. And these 22 friends, relatives, strangers who didn't know Jesus are starting to come to know the Lord. And at the last report, five of those people have committed their lives to Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing what God will do when we take the Great Commission seriously? Each one of those folks receives a copy of the Word of God because a church like yours is generous enough to purchase scriptures that we can ship over to the Ukraine. And we've been able to provide literally hundreds of thousands of scriptures to be placed in the Ukraine and the countries around Ukraine where all the refugees are fleeing to. Another Gideon wrote in to say that for many years they had been uh, witnessing to their neighbor. And their neighbor just never had enough time to have a serious conversation. They were just too busy. God has a way of getting our attention when we get too busy, doesn't he? Well, he got their attention, and, and all of a sudden they became much more open to conversations about things of eternal significance. And they started coming over to their house. In fact, they started staying in their neighbor's house. And they had a lot more time to think because you couldn't just go down to the shopping mall. You couldn't just go down to the park. You couldn't, all those distractions go away. Well, they began to uh, have prayer meetings in their home and they began to kneel down and begin to ask God for forgiveness of their sin. They went from not having time to have converse, to even talk about it to kneeling before God, asking for forgiveness. And the young daughter, 12 years old, began to weep tears of repentance. Last update, they had been in their home for over 50 days. You know, God does amazing things when we take the Great Commission seriously. So we... Uh, we want, we want peace. Don't get me wrong. We want peace. But our prayers right now for what's going on over there are a little bit more pragmatic in that uh, there's a shortage of paper. You know, Scripture is hard to print when you don't have paper. And so if you would, and God lays it on your heart, would you pray that he would provide the paper that's required to print Bibles? in mass. Uh, there's a logistical problem of getting things into the country. So if you pray that God would allow us to, oh, oh, that he would open the doors and allow the flow of scripture to come into the country, I know those folks would appreciate it. And will you pray that people will turn to Jesus? Because God does amazing things when we take the Great Commission. Seriously. And I had a conversation with Pastor Barry there, and I recognize that this church is a church that takes the Great Commission seriously. And I appreciate that about you. So thank you for partnering with the Gideons International. It's because of generous churches like yours that we're actually organizing about 200 nations around the world. We have about 240,000 members uh, spread throughout uh, those, those countries. And even now, just Coming out of COVID, we're still distributing the, cop, the, the Word of God at about one per second. That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, about one a second. God does amazing things when we take the Great Commission seriously. So today I'm, I'm just here to give a report and just to praise God for what he's doing. And if you want to be a part of it, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, first of all is pray. I mentioned that. Second of all, if uh, you'd like to give, we'll be out. Uh, and I love this uh, uh, small group. What's it called? The sm small group launch that you're going to have. So, so 
Okay, okay. Gauntlet, the gauntlet. All right, well, we're going to be out here. If you, if you uh, feel so led of the Lord to, to give to the Giddings International Purchase Scriptures uh, to go and be placed somewhere around the world, uh, we'll be out there, and you can engage with us. And if you're, a, if you're interested in taking the Great Commission seriously, if God's touching your heart to take your faith walk to the next level, please talk to us. Have a conversation with us, and we'll be glad to talk to you about how God might use the Gideons to be part of your testimony. Thanks so much for your time and attention. God bless. day that some are too young to remember, but we will never forget. Never forget the undeserved and unexpected suffering that struck a nation. Never forget the terror of destruction, but the wonder September 11th. A lot of you guys do. Some of you guys are not even old enough to remember. You weren't even there. It's amazing to me to think that it was so long ago that there are adults here that were not there to experience that. Um, but I remember the day I got up, I was headed to work. I was in the van and I'm driving and there was reports coming across that a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. And at that time, it was like, you know, kind of like was what it was before, you know, there was this maybe a Piper plane or like a little plane had gotten off course and had crashed into the Trade Center because that's happened. Um, and I kind of was the way everybody was talking about it. But then as it started to develop and then I got into work and um, one of the girls in our office had set up this little TV and adjusted the antennas so that it was picking up the local news center. And uh, that's when I saw the second plane hit on live TV. And like m most of you were, I was just in shock. Like, you know, you look back and you, and, you, and you remember all the things that took place on that day and all the imagery and all the video, you know, it just doesn't do it justice. You know, the, the feeling of dread and, and, and the, the understanding that thousands of people were losing their lives at that moment. It was just, it was unbelievable, the, the, the feeling of... Uh, Yeah, it just felt like you couldn't breathe. Um, I remember watching the footage of the Pentagon explosion and 
and getting the reports of Pennsylvania and then watching, you know, these types of Im- this type of imagery and, and just thinking to myself, this is surreal. This can't be happening. This can't be true. And then it turned out that it was. And, man, what an experience that day was. And I will never be able to forget it. It was our generation's Pearl Harbor, um, 100%. You know, I mean, it's, I'll never be able to, to, to erase this out of my mind. And I hope that our country will not be able to erase it out of our minds because, man, the things that came out of that, uh, I remember after everything had kind of settled down and people started remembering, you know, what it was, the, the outpouring of patriotism that followed that event was amazing. Where I was at down in Florida, uh, you could get these little flags that would attach to your window, and you'd roll your window up, and they would lodge into the window, and they'd just kind of hang out on both sides of your car. And you could not find a car that didn't have an American flag on it. I mean, it was just, that was, it was just this kind of, uh, kind of, uh, 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 tidal wave or tsunami of, of patriotism that swept across the entire nation. Um, there were no protests. There were no, like, flag burnings. There were no, like, marches. You know, I mean, it's like everybody kind of in this one moment of extreme solidarity kind of came together in this moment of clarity, this moment of unity, this moment of bravery and courage and focus and it's like the whole nation became focused on this one idea that we were attacked and that we need to unite together and we need to rise up against this challenge and not live in fear and not live in, 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 uh, in cowardice, but confront these things. So many people joined the military just because of this event, you know, I mean, because they wanted to go and defend our nation. And, you know, we can have discussions about whether or not the, the wars over in the Middle East were, were actually helpful in that process or not. I guess you could debate those things if you wanted to. I'm not really concerned about that. What I'm, what I'm interested in today is just this kind of like insurmountable unity and courage and, and, and clarity that came with this event and how people just changed in just a moment and everybody became one for this moment. The question is, how did we get from there to here? That tidal wave of patriotism, that tidal wave of clarity and unity and and courage and bravery has been replaced with arguments over systemic racism and, and, and arguments over whether life is sacred or not and ridiculous concepts like drag queens and that children can be participating in drag queen events. And there's this event in Boise that's going on that's a big hot topic right now where um, people are sending their kids to go participate in this drag event. And, you know, whether you believe in that or not, you know, the idea that that you can put a child in a sexually explicit situation and imagine that that's okay, we've come a long way from here, guys. In a very short period of time, in in like two decades, we have completely reversed it so that we're not interested in the country anymore. In fact, we have people in our country, large swaths of people that believe that our country is systemically flawed and that it needs to be changed from the inside out. And that's where you get all the fears about socialism and all the fears about communism and all the fears about you know, totalitarianism and fascism. You hear every, These are words that we hear on a regular basis in our society today that just should not even be there. I mean, that shouldn't be something that we are, we're talking about. This is the United States of America, and God we trust, right? What happened to that? What happened to that moment? You know, where, how did we get from, 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 from firemen raising a flag in patriotism to children dressing as women and parading around on stage and that being okay? How did we get there? What happened? What happened to God bless America, right? I think we took the wrong focus is what I think happened. I think after the events of September 11th, I think we tried to just make the statement, God bless America. 
our, 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 our president said it, our Congress people said it, the news media was saying it, everybody was like, had this kind of theme where we were all like roaring in this direction of God bless America, God bless America. We tried to promote this idea of godly patriotism and, and we tried to like push that on to the world to, to kind of make this kind of ideal that this is what patriotism looks like. It's godly patriotism where God bless America and, and all these kind of wonderful things that we really kind of like, right? We took advantage of a crisis and promoted a good but wrong idea. I mean, there's nothing wrong with patriotism, right? I mean, patriotism is a good thing. Patriotism is needed if you're going to be a part of a country where God has given us the freedom to be able to worship freely, where he's given us freedom of speech, where he's given us all these things that we can utilize to be extremely effective for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, for heaven's sake, there are countries in this world where if you were to promote the ideas that the Gideons are promoting, for instance, you'd just be shot dead. We have an amazing gift here in this country, and, and patriotism or love for your nation is something that is good and it's needed, but obviously an overabundance of, of patriotism is a very, very fleeting thing. It's kind of like feelings, you know, like emotions. You get like an emotion and it's powerful and it's, and it's palpable and it's, and, it's, and it's energizing, but eventually that feeling fades and you discover that there has to be more in place than just the emotion. It's kind of like love, you know? Like when you first met your spouse, there was this feeling of love. There was this energizing, like you couldn't get enough of each other. You wanted to talk all the time. You wanted to be on the phone all the time. You would be talking for hours all the time. This was like, because it was like, there was just this connection that was made and you were pouring into each other. And it was like the violins were playing and the birds were flying around chirping. And you know, everybody was like, there's just like this energy in the air, right? That the love has created. And then eventually what happens? That feeling dissipates over time. It doesn't mean that you don't love your spouse anymore. It's just that, you know, you don't, there's not that like energizing kind of feeling of like oh, breathlessness every time you're in each other's presence. You know, it's like you turn over in bed and you see that person laying there and their hair is all like this and, you know, their breath smells like dragon breath. And, and, and you're like, you know, that feeling of, of like euphoria is hard to attain. It begins to, to wane a little bit over time. And then you learn that, that love and that marriage and all those things, those are things that you choose to do. It's not about emotion anymore. It's about a choice. It's about, a, it's about something that you have selflessly chosen to give yourself over to this person for the glory of God. That's kind of what love and respect is really all about. It's about giving yourself over selflessly to this person because God wants us to do that, right? Right? And then it becomes about a conscious choice, not as much as a feeling, right? Because there's something deeper there. There's something more um, solid to stand on. It's not about the feeling. It's not about the emotion. It's about the choice that you have made and the, and the, and the, and the institution that you've committed to. That's, that's really what it's all about. And if you promote an idea like God bless America and you just push it out there and you just push it out there with propaganda, you know, it's like if you say, like, what is it? If, you, if a person says something loud enough and long enough, it becomes the truth, right? So if you have a whole bunch of people out there and just saying, God bless America, God bless America, God bless America, and you, and you, and you build this idea of, of, of godly unity by this phrase, what's going to happen when the emotion falls away and there's no foundation to stand upon. That's what happened to us. We had this tragic event that we need to remember. In that tragic event, there was this euphoric kind of God bless America idea that rose, and it was a wonderful time of patriotism. But as ideas begin to fade, and as, I, and, and as other ideas begin to, begin to increase, and as our emotions begin to ramp down, and there's no foundation to land upon, what you do is you just end up sinking into despair, and you end up sinking into immorality, and you end up sinking into, into, into things that don't support our nation as a foundation. 
I think that what we need to understand is what Paul was trying to say in 2 Corinthians. When he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3-4, through 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto them. The one thing that we have to understand is, is we have to understand that the people of this world are blinded to the truth of God. Now, I'm going to step through this to kind of get to a point because I think it's important for us to understand our position in this world. You know, there was a discussion not too long ago this week on a, on a text thread that I'm a part of in our church, and we were talking about uh, biblical worldviews and how there's less than like, what was it, like 4% of executive pastors have a biblical worldview, um, which is a terrifying thought. But what is a biblical worldview? By what measure are you, are you taking that data? By, by what, what, is the, what is the benchmark for a biblical worldview? You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to understand where we stand as far as believers are concerned and what our worldview should be when it comes to talking about all these things that are happening in our world. Like, what, what is our position? Where, where do we stand? What is a biblical worldview? And all of this. Well, first of all, we have to understand where the world is at, right? This is what Paul was trying to get to. The God of this world is who? Who is the God of this world, right? Well, the God of this world in this context is Satan. That's what he's trying to allude to, right? Not that God doesn't own it, right? God could snap his fingers and annihilate this world and everything that's upon it and be completely justified in doing it because he created it. But that doesn't mean that Satan is not in possession of it. The one thing you have to understand is, is that God, in his, in, in, his, in his understanding of how our lives work, in the scope of redemption, there has to be this place where redemption has to be found. If we were living in a world where there was no sin, we wouldn't need redemption, and therefore we wouldn't be preaching the things that we're preaching. We'd be preaching a different thing. We would just be glorifying God in all of his wonderful glory and perfection, but that's not the world we live in, is it? In fact, the world that we live in, if you watch the news for any length of time, you'll see that God is not in control of all the things that are happening in this world, that Satan has dominion over it. And that Satan is ruling over it. And that he is leading people into the darkness. In fact, the God of this world is blinding people to the truth. Actively blinding people. I mean, it's like his job is to make sure that he casts enough of a shadow and enough darkness over the people of this world so that no light can penetrate it. So that no light can get through the darkness in order to show them what is hidden to them. We're going to talk about that in a second. Not that Satan reigns over all things, but all those that are not of God are of their father the devil. This is what Jesus said to those that didn't accept him as the Messiah. It was like, if, if you can't accept me as Christ, then you're not of me, you're of something else. You're of your father the, the devil. You know, we understand that, that at one point when we were lost in trespass and sin, that we were separated from God. That there was this separation that was existing there, and that separation that existed could only, be, could only be traversed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, an arisen Savior, who conquered death, who conquered sin. It's the only thing that could, that could overcome that, that traverse that was created between man and God. And every man that exists in this world that is outside of the Spirit of God is in that position where they're separated from God, blinded by Satan. That's why it does. That's why you know we can we can talk to people all day long about the way that we think and the way that we believe. But ultimately, what it what it boils down to is, is like all those discussions and all those debates and all those those confrontations that we have with people that don't share our ideology. It's almost like casting your pearl to swine. Because they're never going to accept biblical truth. 
as it's just presented to them as biblical truth. Why? Because they're blinded to it. God in his mercy holds back the wrath that this world deserves, right? It's like, why doesn't God just come back? You know, we're always like, even so, Lord Jesus, come. You know, that's our, that's our plea. That's our cry. We would love for Christ to return right now. And there's nothing preventing him from that. The imminent return of Christ is at any moment. Nothing needs to be accomplished. Why doesn't he just come and end all the suffering? Why doesn't he just come and end all the sin and all those things? The reason that he doesn't come is because his mercy holds his wrath back. He is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-10. through 10. He doesn't, he's not willing that any should perish and go to hell. That's not his intent. That's not his desire. In fact, he wants all people to come to Christ. That's why he said, for, for whosoever will believe in his name shall be saved. That's why he said that, because he's not, he's not willing that any should be left in this darkness that is being shrouded over them. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe. The truth, the truth being hidden to them. The first statement that Paul makes in all of this is he says that the truth is not hidden to us. The truth is hidden to them that are blinded. That is why when we see things like this, we see different things than the world sees completely. A lost person will look at this, and they may agree with you on some of the fine points of this, but they don't look at it the same way that you do. And the reason they don't look at it the same way that you do is because you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you that's calling you to a biblical worldview. That's why you'll never sit down with a transgender person and have a discussion about how wrong that this is, because they're never going to see how wrong that it is, that there is a tiny child sitting in that chair right there. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Right here. Blurred out. The face is blurred out, but there's a child sitting right there. That child is no more than like seven or eight years old. But you cannot convince them that it's a bad idea to sexually to expose children sexually to these things. You'll never convince them of that. Why? Because when they see that picture, they don't see the same thing that you see. Why don't they see the same thing that you see? Because they're blinded to the truth. Most political disagreement can be found downstream of morality. In fact, all politics is downstream of morality. I don't know if you know that or not. All politics are downstream from morality, and morality is always downstream from religion and philosophy. Morality exists in the world because there is ultimate truth for us. The reason that we have morality is because for us, we have absolute truth, and the absolute truth is, is that God is absolute truth. So what he says is absolute truth. It's easy for us. But for a person that doesn't believe that there's absolute truth, that there is no absolute kind of truth to kind of guide their lives, they're out in limbo trying to adjust truth for every people group. And so how do you possibly think that you're going to come to terms on what is good and right and just and fair and righteous and holy? You're never going to come to terms on that because you're going to have a fixed position. Their position is going to be like this, right? It's a moving target. The goalpost is always moving. These individuals that you see in this picture, from abortion to transgenderism to the idea that systemic racism exists in our world today, all of these views that you see up here, these exist because they are blinded to the truth and can only see them as what is presented to them. This is something you have to understand when you're dealing with the world. This is the beginning of your biblical position. Your biblical worldview comes first by understanding that the world will never understand your truth. It'll never understand biblical ideology. It'll never understand. We do the Liberty Rumble here, and we do the, the three pastors walk into the bar. We often talk about political things. In fact, the Liberty Rumble is dedicated to the political things, although it's a little bit comedic. 
But we talk about those things. And why do we talk about those things, right? Well, because it's important for all of us to be informed on what's going on out there. That's for us, right? But when you're out in the world and you're trying to discuss these moral issues, these deep moral divides that we have, and you're in the Facebook group and you're trying to convince somebody of the truth, I, I'm guilty of this. I do this all the time. You know, I'm always out there trying to promote some type of a biblical morality into something, you know, trying to at least inject some truth into it. But what you have to understand is, is that biblical morality and that truth that you're trying to inject in that, I mean, guys, it's like, it's like pouring water into a bottomless pit. It's just not going to go anywhere. Oftentimes, it's just dismissed out of hand. To what you may ask, are they blinded? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. That's blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto, unto them. What's hid to them? The, what's hid to them is the gospel. What's hid to them is the gospel of Jesus Christ and what that is. That's completely hidden to them. And in fact, Satan will let you discuss anything that you want. But if you begin to eject the gospel into a conversation, it will get shut down immediately. Why? Because Satan must keep the world darkened and hidden to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if we do not have the gospel, if we are not commission-minded, then we're losing the battle. The idea that 5% of people actually share their faith is the reason that we're in the situation we're in today. Absolutely, 100%. It has to be every single individual who is a born-again believer in Jesus Christ must be committed to the idea that the gospel of Jesus Christ must be proliferated to all people because it is the only light that matters. There's a song that I listen to often it's from uh, Pink Floyd. I don't care how you feel about Pink Floyd. I don't really care. <laughs> this song is one of the most underrated songs that, that is out in popular music. It doesn't get a lot of traction because it's not super popular. But on the Turning Away, it's on the Momentary Lapse of Reason album. I wouldn't recommend going to buying it, but I get it on Apple. So, you know, whatever. You can do whatever you want to with that. Um, there's a quote at the very beginning. It says, it's a shame that somehow light has changed into shadow and casted a shroud over all we have known. If that doesn't impact you as a believer, I mean, think about that for a second, that light has become a shadow that has casted a shroud over all that we have known. Christianity is a shadow of its former self. If 5% of believers are sharing their faith and that's it, then Christianity is no longer the light. We are no longer the ones that are providing the light. And in fact, there's no wonder why darkness is prevailing if 5% of believers are sharing their faith. Thank God for groups like the Gideons. Thank God for groups that are out there that are promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ because Believers aren't getting the job done. It is a shame that somehow light has changed into shadow and casted a shroud over all that we have known. It is a terrible shame. It's like, how do you get back to where we were, it's through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the reason why the first part of our mission statement is to go. Because the Great Commission is the most important thing that we have. 
every individual that's sitting in this room, I don't care who you are, myself included, we should be reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no training class needed. There's no special system that you need. We've talked about this over and over and over again. What we just need is we need people to be as passionate about the gospel as they are about politics. We need to be, have, have people that are as passionate about the gospel as they are about their hobbies. We need people to be as passionate about the gospel as they are about their families, as they are about learning, as they are about growing, as they are about their, their, their moms and dads and their, and their kids and their, and their jobs and their retirements. And, you know, we need people to decide that the gospel of Jesus Christ is more important than all of those things. When we have that, what we will have is a revival. That's the hard part, right? Because it's not just about repenting and getting on our knees and asking God to bless our nation, right? That's, that's great. That's wonderful. That's not what Christ told us to do when he left. Christ didn't tell us, hey guys, I want you to go to your closet. I want you to get on your knees and I want you to pray for our nation. That's not what he told you. What he told you was to go into every nation and to preach and teach and baptize and make disciples. That's what he told you. And he didn't tell that to just me. And he didn't tell it to just Ken or just Greg or just Richard or just our deacons. He gave that job to the church. And if you are a born-again believer sitting in this room today, you are a part of that movement. Whether you take hold of the local church ideology or whether you like the universal church ideology, I don't really give a flip. If you're a believer in here today and you're saved by the grace of God, then you should be interested in the gospel going out to people, first and foremost, everything we do. Go, reach, and build. It's the reason we believe that. In God we trust is not the gospel. You can put it on your money. You can put it in your courthouses. You can stand the Ten Commandments up in the middle of the Capitol Rotunda with a giant statue of Jesus holding an American flag. You can be as as, as Christian patriot as you want to be, all of that stuff is not the gospel. No one has ever been saved by a dollar bill. I'll tell you that right now. Or a quarter. Or a slogan in front of a judge's bench. All that stuff's great. It's wonderful. It is not the gospel. We do not need to be focused on the fleeting feelings of patriotism. Those are great. Don't get me wrong. We don't need more slogans. We don't need more banners. We don't need more patriotic presidents. We don't need any more political commentary, even though I want you to listen to the Liberty Rumble and the three <laughs> pastors walk into the bar. Even though I want you to listen to those. We don't need any more of that, right? What we need is we need Jesus... And his gospel preached to all corners of the earth. That is what we need, and that alone. Ask yourself a question. Why is it easier for us to debate and talk about politics than it is for us to share Jesus? There's all kinds of reasons. I mean, I just like people answering just like right there. I just heard like four reasons. And those reasons are the reasons why it's so easy to debate and argue about politics and why it's so hard to tell someone about Jesus.
we're not in a battle for patriotism. We're not in a battle for freedom. We're not even in a battle for the Constitution of the United States. We're not in a battle for the Declaration of Independence. All of those things might be true, and yes, there might be a time where when tyranny arises and becomes law, resistance is necessary. All that might be true, yes. But when we get back to this, that will return. I guarantee it. If we truly and absolutely want to save our country, and you're interested in the freedoms that we enjoy, and you want to honor the memory of all those that have sacrificed everything so that we can enjoy these freedoms, the absolute best thing that you can do is to share your faith with someone else. Is to share the gospel. So next time you're in your workplace and that person's like, man, did you see what was going on and so and so and blah, 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 and then you have the opportunity to have a discussion about politics. Just say, you know what would make that all better? is if they knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. That would make it all better. Can I tell you about what Jesus did for me? That's all you need. It's simple. I can tell you what Jesus did for me. In fact, we're doing a podcast tomorrow where we're going to talk about my testimony and we're going to talk about how Jesus brought me to Christ. It's going to be great. There's a lot to share. It's amazing what God can do. We should be exalting that. The best way to remember 9-11 and the best way to never forget is absolutely to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, We I'm ashamed to say, Father, that that your people in this nation have failed you. We have failed to take seriously the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a people, when we look at statistics like 5% of Christians are sharing their faith, you know, I mean, it's obvious that 95% of them don't see the importance of sharing their faith to other people. And God, that's the exact opposite of what you asked us to do. I can't imagine how that disappoints you. And, It breaks my heart. How disappointed that you must be in your people. God, that we could have a revival of hearts that knew how important that it was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we could have people rise up and change that 5% and reverse that around so that everybody took seriously how important it was that we share you with everyone. That's what you told us to do. Father, I can't speak for everyone, but for myself, I can only say that I'm sorry that I failed you where I failed you. Father, I said something in a service not too long ago that just stuck with me so powerfully. Just be better at being good. If we could all take a hold of that, 
and promote the gospel with that concept of just being better at being good. Father, help us to be better at being the light of this world. Because without it, there is no hope. Father, would you break our hearts? Would you bring us to the altar? Would you help us to repent? To ask for your forgiveness? And to reset our minds? A paradigm shift in the way that we think that brings forward the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, to the forefront of our thoughts. Father, help us. In your son's name we pray.